Well, why won't the international community investigate the bombing of the Nord Stream pipeline, the largest ecological disaster, the largest ecological attack in world history? Seems like a good idea, maybe to get some answers on that. Um, they don't seem to really care about that. Tucker Carlson asked that question to presidential candidate Nikki Haley uh, over the weekend, and she didn't have any kind of answer. Watch. Well, speaking of, of energy in the military, who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? I mean, I, I don't know. Do I'm, not, I'm not claiming you did it. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, That's what I'm saying. Do you know who did it? Uh, seems pretty obvious it was backed by the Biden administration, I would say. I mean, I think all the evidence suggests that, but I wasn't there. I guess uh, what I'm really saying is if you were running against the Biden administration to do something like that and shaft our closest allies in the world, which would be Western Europe, and deprive them of the energy they need to run their manufacturing sector and destroy their economy, which it is in the process of doing, like, that's a major sin to have done something like that. You just well, betrayed our allies, and no one on the right is accusing the Bidens of what they clearly did. So I don't know why. My next guest, though, is asking that question. Jeffrey Brodsky is a journalist who just testified before the United Nations. Watch. Thank you very much. My name is Jeffrey Brodsky. I'm the only journalist to travel to all four blast sites of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines on the Baltic Sea. I've been investigating the Nord Stream sabotage since the day it occurred on September 26, 2022. I appear before the United Nations Security Council on my own behalf. I represent no government or organization in the testimony that I will deliver. The attack on the Nord Stream pipelines is likely the most severe act of eco-terrorism and the largest instance of industrial sabotage in history. And Jeffrey joins us now to talk about his investigation and looking into the Nord Stream pipeline. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thank you, Clayton. Pleasure to be here. So why did you start investigating this? Oh, um, well, I was, when this took place on September 26, 2022, when the sabotage occurred, um, I was just fascinated by it. And I was a little bit taken aback, frankly, um, that it didn't seem like the mainstream media in particular was, was interested in asking any hard questions or um, really investigating the sabotage. Um, and I, so I read as much about it as I possibly could. I talked to some politicians, mainly European politicians. I talked to some experts, um, researchers and scholars, and I learned as much about the sabotage as I possibly could. And then when I did, um, when I felt that I had enough knowledge, I started contacting some editors of uh, magazines and newspapers, and they were interested in what I was saying. And then I became, uh, then I started um, really investigating even e even more deeply and more thoroughly um, um, into, into what happened into the sabotage. To dive even more deeply into this, um, you testified before the United Nations, bringing to their uh, bringing to their attention some things that you found. Uh, you're the, one, the only journalist, to my knowledge, that's gone to all four of the different sites. Um, what did you find? How did you first of all? How did you locate these sites, and how, and what did you find when you got there? Okay, so um, yeah, I th I think I am the only um, journalist to go to all four blast sites. Um, they, they, you know, they're not difficult to locate. Um, anyone can, you know, geo coordinates, uh, longitude, latitude, they, they can be located quite easily. Um, we had a sonar um, device on our boat. Um, and the I went with, a, we chartered a boat, um, and the captain and his first mate were very knowledgeable. Um, these people um, take, they do a lot of expeditions on the Baltic Sea, and it was quite easy for them to locate all four, all four of the blast sites. Um, as to what we found, well, um, we found the, what was most significant that we found was the purpose of our expedition was really three things. We wanted to, one, determine the amount of explosives used um, at each blast site in the attack. We wanted in kilograms. We wanted to figure out where the explosives were placed, where the bombs were placed, where they placed on the pipeline, under the pipeline, um, next to the pipeline. Um, and we wanted to figure out what type of charges were used. Were these linear shape charges? Were these bulk, bulk explosives? Were these um, canonical charges? Um, and we were able to do that um, by capturing um, underwater drone images um, and videos that had never been seen by the public before of all four blast sites. And we were able to do that by 
also um, capturing sonar images of all soft blast sites. I then took this data um, that was obtained through the expedition and I showed it to explosive experts, um, ex US Navy SEALs, um, the managing director of an explosive engineering company. And for the first time, they were able to calculate accurately um, the amount of explosives um, used in the attack at, at all four of the blast sites, for example. Um, that was really significant because um, before it had been reported uh, previously, um, and er erroneously, I should say, that it was um, up to, for example, about 500 kilograms of explosives used at each site or even more. Um, but those calculations were were inaccurate and they were just far over overestimated. Um, these experts that I talked to um, and have quoted in my articles, they've said that it's between 10 and 50 kilograms um, per blast site. Why is that significant? significant? Can you educate us? Yeah, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because, you know, knowing um, the amount of explosives used um, and used can is one of the clues to how the operation was carried out, how it could have been carried out, what was used to carry um, to carry out the operation. Perhaps um, the size of the boat. Yeah. Size of the boat, certainly. Um, whether or not you know divers went, whether or not a submarine would have been needed, perhaps what kind of UUV would have been required, um, and you know that would indicate that you know a smaller boat could have been possibly used. And it also indicates that divers were likely used. A submarine was probably not involved, or it may have been, but you know, a diver could have done this certainly without the assistance of a submarine, according to the experts I've spoken to. Um, so that was all significant. Um, you know, those were significant findings um, and clues um, that could really um, lead to, you know, hopefully at some point unmasking a perpetrator. So fewer than 500 kilograms of explosive used at these four different blast sites. Vastly 10. fewer, um, 10 to 50 and 50 would be the very high range. Most of the experts I've spoken to said it's, you know, closer to the 50 figure than the 10, than the 10 figure. So what was the United Nations response when you presented this data to them? Well, the United Nations response was, I, unfortunately, what, what its response has been, you know, since this took place, you know, approximately eight months ago, um, it seems that everyone that all the countries and security councils kind of fell back to their previous positions, um, which is that there is an, you know, saying that there is an ongoing investigation. Um, I should say there are three ongoing investigations conduct, um, they would be conducted by Sweden, Germany, and Denmark, separate investigations. And they keep saying, um, well, we should just relate, re wait for these results. But, you know, it's very unlikely, at least according to the experts I've spoken to, and at least what we know about, you know, um, underwater surveillance systems, that these countries, at least Sweden in particular, doesn't know what happened. And the U.S. doesn't know what happened. And it seems to me that these countries are dragging their feet. Um, and, you know, when $26 billion of critical infrastructure is blown up, infrastructure that was critical to the European economy, particularly the German economy, which is often called the motor of the European Union, um, is sabotaged. Um, it seems to me that the public has a right um, to know who did this and how it happened. Um, and it's in the public interest to know. And I'm not really sure why um, there isn't consensus um, in the UN Security Council about this. What surprised you the most, apart from this, maybe the size of the explosives? Was there anything that stood out to you that maybe contradicted some of the reporting we've seen from Seymour Hirsch and others that point, point fingers specifically I, I, I at the United States? I don't Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure if, the, uh, if Seymour Hirsch's reporting has been outright contradicted, but, you know, he did, um, he did mention in an interview, um, maybe two interviews, I'm not really sure, um, that there was probably two bombs used on each pipeline. Um, it looks like there was just one um, bomb used on each pipeline. And it looks like, um, but on the other hand, there are some things in his reporting that, you know, seem to be corroborated, um, that there were probably divers used. Um, and do we know from whom, which country, who was involved? I mean, again, what Seymour Hersh has said is one thing, and there now it seems to be the United States and the mainstream media in the United States is trying to push the blame off on some rogue Ukrainians um, within Ukrainian security service that no longer alive. So it's an easy scapegoat. Um, what does your research show you about that? Able to confirm or deny any of that? Um, it's not it's not able to confirm or deny any of that. But there is some there's some open source um, 
research that can, you know, that indicates that the United States and its allies, um, particularly the United States and Sweden, um, know who, exactly who did this. Um, and I'm just going to you know, kind of quote, there was an article, a wonderful article by James Bamford in The Nation, and he talks about something called um, what he calls a little known and highly secretive integrated undersea surveillance system. This is a surveillance system that was um, that is that was built by the U.S. Um, with the um, with Sweden's help, ironically. Um, and what it is is these are kind of arrays of acoustic sensors that are tethered to the seafloor. And what these what they do what this surveillance system does is it can analyze distinct engine sounds. So if you have you know whether it's aircraft or whether it's a sea vessel, whether it's subsea or a surface vessel, you can turn off your transponder. There's also ways for you know satellite not to detect you, but it's really tough to turn off your engine and go anywhere. So just by the you know the you know let's very um, unsophisticatedly call it the purr of the engine, you can identify and um, actually fingerprint, as James Banford says in his speech, you can fingerprint the vessel. Hmm. So if these vessels can be fingerprinted, the question is, why haven't why isn't the U.S. said anything about these vessels? Why haven't they made these vessels public? Well, Jeffrey, you know, of and, course, the Baltic Sea, I mean, it's incredibly remote. No one can go there. Um, maybe a few penguins. It's so far removed from civilization. Of course, I'm being sarcastic here. The Baltic Sea is a major thoroughfare. And can anything happen in the Baltic Sea that we don't know about? Well, you know, Clayton, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, you know, I interviewed um, a lot of people um, on the record and off the record. And one of the... Um, MPs, the uh, European MPs, a German MP that I interviewed, um, you know, I asked him basically that same question, um, you know, is it possible that we, we still don't know? And I should say this MP also, I believe he sits on uh, intelligence committees. Um, he, you know, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but I, I, I quoted him exactly in my United Nations remarks, um, that he said something like to me, you know, Jeffrey, um, this is the most highly monitored and trafficked body of water um, on the planet. Um, this is the Baltic Sea. This is not Mars. Um, how is it possible that a massive, you know, terrorist attack like this takes place in the middle of the Baltic Sea? And everyone's, you know, and now I'm speaking, not him. Um, you know, everyone throws up their arms and says, you know, we we're stumped. We don't know. Doesn't, it's remarkable. Doesn't seem to add up. Yeah, there's a lot that doesn't add up here. Uh, one piece I'll just kind of get you out of here on this point, and it's come to light in the past few days with this attack on the on in Crimea over the bridge over the past 24 hours, that the BBC reports, well, the Ukrainians contacted us, and yes, it was the Ukrainian Navy along with the Ukrainian Sur Security Service that carried out this attack, and they're very proud of this attack, right? So this Ukrainian Navy, where, is, where does this new Ukrainian Navy pop up from out of? Because we've heard when the attack on the Nord Stream, well, Ukraine doesn't have a Navy anymore. It's been destroyed. But now the Ukraine Ukraine has a Navy suddenly. So there's this back and forth debate about, well, where's 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 Ukraine getting this Navy all of a sudden? Um, anything come to light in your research about that, the Ukrainian Navy piece of this and what type of ship might have been used? Um, the, not what type of ship can be used, but, you know, there is, again, some open source um things on there, or, or now it's open source. You know, the Discord leaks, you probably remember, I think it was quoted in the Washington Post. Um, Zelensky is quoted as saying, um, you know, that they should maybe blow up other pipelines, other Russian pipelines. And, I, you know, I should also say, you asked me, um, Clayton, about, you know, why, why why was it so significant to go to all four blast sites? Um, you know, the BBC um, chartered an expedition to one of the blast sites in October, of two, I think it was October of 2022. So just the month after the sabotage occurred. Um, and, you know, they made a big mistake. They um, actually only went to one of the blast sites and it's very, it's almost 100% accurate to say they did not even find natural blast site. What they did is they found a, a 250 50 meter long rupture in the pipeline, if I remember correctly. And this, when you have a 250 meter long rupture, you can't determine where was the bomb placed, um, how, my, how, you know, how many um, explosives and kilograms were used. Um, you can't really draw any significant conclusions. Um, experts can draw any uh, significant conclusions. So, and furthermore, the BBC, when you, it's what they found was a large rupture in the pipeline. In other words, just a large hole. But the rupture was actually not caused by a bomb um, or the explosions. The rupture was caused by the overpressure of gas, the rapid release of the gas um, due to the bomb in a separate 
area of the pipeline. So what was really significant is we went to um, Nord Stream 2 line A in the Swedish exclusive Swedish economic zone. And that is, you know, the depressurized site. This site was blown, this line was blown up twice. And the site we went to was blown up approximately 17 hours after the first explosions. And therefore, when you show images and pictures um, or picture images and videos to experts of this site, you're able to, they, they were able to um, make accurate conclusions, draw accurate conclusions about the, the amount of charges, the placement of the charges, and the, and the, and the type of charges. That, that's what's really significant. And it was curious to me, you know, why the BBC, and I think there was a, a later expedition just last month in June um, by Danish TV to a public television station. And it was curious to me why they didn't go to the, you know, the depressurized site. Why didn't they go to line A, Nord Stream 2 in the Swedish zone? Because that's really the site that can, that can provide clues and insight into how the sabotage was carried out. Convenient, convenient omission, uh, which is exactly what the media is excellent at. Jeffrey Brodsky, we look forward to your continued reporting on this. We'd love to have you back on the show as you uncover more about this story, which I think is one of the most important stories of our time, uh, the bombing of the Nord Stream pipeline. Thank you so much for this. We appreciate it. Thank you, Clayton. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.